This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to re-watching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Katie White, and joining me as always is my good friend and co-host, Chad Hopkins. Hi, Chad. How are you? I am doing great, Katie. Enjoyed my weekend. My roommate's birthday was yesterday, so we had some good times out. We took a cocktail class. We went to dinner. We had a lot of fun. And so I'm winding down the weekend with some of The Office, which I like to do. (laughs) A cocktail class? That's cool. Yeah, we got to make our own uh, tiki drink. And then uh, we made a strawberry margarita with mango infused tequila. That was really good. So nice. That's fun. Yeah. Well, we do have a new review this week. It's nice to start off these episodes with a a new review just about every week. It's been pretty consistent. And so we definitely appreciate this new one from Bexer's Girl. Uh, Very kind words. Thank you for taking the time to review and to rate the show. And as always, we would certainly appreciate it if you haven't if you took the time to do the same, because it's going to be a big boost to our listenership and to our visibility on iTunes. I think that clears up all the housework for this week, so let's just get started with episode 17 of season 2 called Dwight's Speech. It aired on March 2nd, 2006, directed by Charles McDougall and written by Paul Lieberstein. Dwight has been awarded the Salesman of the Year Award for Northeastern Pennsylvania, which comes with an award, a prize, or some money, and the opportunity to give a speech in front of all the other salesmen and women, of course. We learn that Dwight is terrified of public speaking, so he turns to Michael, who actually won the same award two years in a row when he was a salesman, uh, for advice. Michael tries, but eventually deems Dwight a lost cause. Jim, however, gives some fake tips that actually end up in Dwight's favor, although I don't think that was Jim's expectation when he did so. Anyways, back at the office, Pam's marriage to Roy is drawing steadily closer, so lots of planning is getting done at the office, uh, right in front of Jim, to his dismay for sure. And so he decides in this episode to take a trip to an as-yet-undetermined destination as a means of escape. So clearly a big Dwight episode this episode, and Michael as well, as pretty much always, it's a big Michael episode, but we get some Dwight, which is good. We haven't gotten a lot of him in the last couple. Yeah, not too much Dwight in the past, but we learn a lot more about him, I think. He's very big-headed. He's very uh, cocky now that he has won this award. According to Jim, it's literally the highest possible honor that a Northeastern Pennsylvania-based mid-sized paper company regional salesman can attain. (laughs) <laughs> very specific <laughs> yeah very specific i mean for for their very limited market dwight has excelled dwight apparently wasn't aware that he was giving such a major speech he thought that oh, i'd go up on the stage i'd say thank you i'd accept my award i'd walk off but michael says no this is the biggest speech of your life you better be prepared and he freaks out and he reveals in a talking head that he once participated in a spelling bee And uh, he was against this guy named Raj Patel, and he, in front of the entire school, misspelled the word failure, (laughs) which is uh, like poetic irony or whatever you want to call it. Um, And funny enough, I think that line was actually a an ad lib or uh, an improvisation, if I remember correctly. It's so well done and it's just too perfect. It is a good one. And Michael does say that this is going to be the biggest speech of Dwight's life and Dwight gets nervous. And me watching, I remember for the first time this episode, I was thinking, you know, it's Michael. He's probably exaggerating, but it actually is a pretty big speech. It's a big room, lots of people. And I really didn't expect it to be such a large audience. But I think when Dwight gets there, he finally kind of clams up um, and gets really nervous. And of course, he doesn't go on stage for several minutes it seems um and in the deleted scenes we get several more minutes of michael just ad-libbing and making up lost time because dwight's sitting frozen in his chair Uh, i didn't expect it to be such a big deal but it was no it certainly does appear to be a big deal in fact also in the deleted scenes they're walking around and they go to a couple of wrong rooms for these smaller events that are taking place at the same hotel and there there are a lot smaller rooms and all of a sudden they come up on the real room and Michael says, oh, this is a lot bigger than I remember. And there's like a serious sound system. The lights are low. There's spotlights on the stage. There's a big podium up on the stage. It's a pretty big deal. And they've got seats on the front row. So Dwight spends all day trying to prepare for this. He goes to Michael because Michael never tires of reminding us that he won the same award two consecutive years in a row back in the late 90s when he was still a salesman. And he brings it up several, several times. He actually brings out his certificate and his plaque 
uh, that he received for this award both years from a safe that he keeps in his office. So he thinks very highly of himself in these awards. And he thinks, oh, you know, I killed it. I did an awesome job with my speeches. So they're going to be expecting a lot out of you since we're at the same branch. And he says, you know, Dwight, I don't have enough time in the day to, to make you as good as I am, but I can at least get you to the point where you're not going to embarrass our company. And so they go through all these different exercises and Dwight practices on him in the conference room. And then Michael says, it doesn't matter what you say, Dwight. It just matters that you say something that people care about. And so Michael goes out into the main office area and he tells everybody that because of their excellent performance and the branch is doing so well this quarter, everybody gets a thousand dollar bonus check and everybody's happy. Everybody cheers. Stanley makes a call to his wife saying that they should go forward with the, the wallpapering that they've been planning, but apparently didn't have the money for Dwight's excited for this too. He's oh yeah. It's so great about that bonus. And Michael said, no, no, that wasn't real. Well, <laughs> he says, he said it was just talking, right? Yeah. It <laughs> As was if just talking. talking doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. He said, you see how they responded to me in that moment. I had them. Well, yeah. You told them they were all getting a thousand bucks. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> So Dwight goes out and tries to accomplish the same thing. And instead of telling them good news, he says, there's been this huge accident on 84. There's broken glass everywhere, flipped cars, lots of injuries. Brad Pitt was in the accident too, and he's never going to act again. Oh, and also the bonuses aren't real. (laughs) Let's just throw that in, right? Yeah, let's just throw that in because I'm on such a roll already. Dwight, he just... He absolutely kills any sort of mood, not that the mood was genuine anyway, since Michael was lying, but Dwight just, he's not, he doesn't fit into the Michael persona, where Michael is saying, tell them jokes, make them feel good, do all that kind of stuff, and Dwight's not that kind of person. And Michael is so proud of his two awards, and he is just peacocking around the office, and He's such a proud teacher. He's so proud of his own accomplishments that he he belittles Dwight the whole day about, you're never going to be as good as me, but I will try to impart a nugget of wisdom on you. And when in reality, Dwight gave it a much better speech than Michael did, there were crickets in the audience when Michael was speaking and he was sweating and, you know, doing a horrible job. But Dwight was the one that actually captivated them. And it's funny because he took Jim's advice. You know, Jim was actually getting pretty sick (laughs) of Dwight because he was, Dwight was peacocking, doing his own peacocking around before he found out about the, the speech. He was eating grapes, like some sort of Roman emperor, hanging them over his head. Uh, (laughs) He he was being ridiculous and uh, saying, oh, oh, does the pizza that you won for being in ninth place play DVDs, Jim? Hmm. Uh, I mean, he was just being a big show off. And so Jim has enough of it and decides to give him speeches from famous dictators, namely Benito Mussolini, and tells him, you've got to pound your fist on your desk and you've got to wave your arms and shout as much as you can. And uh, there's this great shot while Jim is pounding on his own desk and uh, the the camera zooms in on Dwight's bobblehead of himself shaking and responding to the vibrations from Jim. Just a funny little thing. And Jim clearly doesn't think this is going to pay off, or if it does pay off, it's going to be everybody laughing at him because it's such a ridiculous thing. But that sort of goes against him, too, because Dwight goes, and when he finally gathers the courage to go on stage and relieve Michael, who's doing such a poor job stalling, he gets into it, and it doesn't take long before they're clapping. They're liking what he's saying, and uh, he, I mean, before long, it turns into a full-blown cheer. Everybody loves Dwight's speech. It's it's really quite amazing and michael scoffs and looks at the camera like are you kidding me and walks off and has a couple drinks at the bar (laughs) it's one of jim's more poorly planned pranks because a it's mussolini i may be wrong here but i think most people would not be able to peg a mussolini speech over say a hitler speech i think if you you know were quoting adolf hitler on the stand maybe more people would know (laughs) this guy has no idea what he's talking about and b Dictators are notoriously well-spoken people. That's what they have, is they can rally a crowd. So Jim kind of, this is one of his one of his worst pranks, because he did a good job in, in getting Dwight to uh, really rally a crowd. It doesn't go exactly the way he wanted, but good for Dwight that he was able to pull off such a successful speech. And at the end of the day, he goes up to Michael in the bar and says, what happened to you? Are you okay? And Michael says, oh, yeah, I'm fine. I just got thirsty. 
And he starts telling the story of this woman who came up to the bar who got carded but didn't have her ID. So she said she was going to go back to her room, get her ID, and come back to order her drink. Michael says she hasn't shown up yet. So she's probably just in her room drinking from the mini bar. And Dwight loves it. He's eating it up. He's laughing. It's so funny. And Michael's still continuing to ham it up and goes to a talking head and says, You know what? I just captivated the guy who captivated a thousand guys. Can you believe it? A thousand guys. So at the end of the day, even though he failed, Dwight was successful. He's turning it into, look at this great teacher I am. I captivated this guy. So that means I have the same influence over these other guys. And really, it's about my accomplishments today, not Dwight's. He finds a way to turn it on himself. I also thought it was interesting, speaking of of Michael and Dwight, that we learn that assistant regional manager is not an actual position. I guess this is the first time that we've heard that, um, that Michael completely made up that position and that it does not exist in other branches. So first he was assistant to the regional manager. He's finally been promoted to assistant regional manager. And that's not even a real position. So he's back to square one. He's just a salesman again. <laughs> Dwight looks so defeated in that moment. It's so sad. Because he, he calls all the other people in the office his subordinates. He's he's trying to give a speech to them. And he says, you know, Michael, this isn't working because I'm not nervous in front of them. They're my subordinates. Jim says, no, you're not. <laughs> and that's when Michael reveals to Dwight that, yeah, assistant regional manager is not a real thing. Speaking of Jim, uh, going back to this trip that he has decided to go on, he doesn't know where it's going to be. He doesn't know when it's going to be necessarily. Or I guess he does, as we find out at the end of the episode. He's trying to escape because Pam is planning her wedding in the office and she has her own talking head and she realizes that it's probably pretty uncomfortable for Jim because Jim does or has had this crush on her and she tries to avoid using his name but says, you know, I'm aware it makes some people uncomfortable. I wouldn't want to make Angela uncomfortable with me planning my wedding here. But it's clearly for Jim that she is trying to minimize it but really isn't very successful. And Jim, of course, is not planning his trip for right now. He's planning it to leave during Pam's wedding, so he will not be at the wedding. And we have that little moment towards the end where Jim and Pam are talking about his trip, and Pam's all excited for him, and she says, oh my gosh, when are you leaving? And he says, right before your wedding. I'm so sorry I won't be there, but you know. And uh, Pam's pretty bummed, but I think Jim just really, really cannot go to this wedding. And if he was in town, he would have no excuse not to go. And I think the way he tells her the date, he is insinuating it's because your wedding is June 10th that I'm not going to be there. Like, I think the look in his eyes, the way he's looking at her and the way he says it to her, he's saying, you know, because your wedding is on June 10th, I am leaving June 8th. Although he doesn't explicitly say it. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 It's I just agree. This, this certain look. He's like, she, she says, when are you leaving? And he says, it's June 8th. I'm like, come on, Pam, you yeah. understand. The way that the words come out of his mouth is apologetic to begin with. It's, uh, it's June 8th. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and this is after earlier in the episode. Uh, the whole time, Ryan and Kelly have actually been helping Pam put together wedding invitations. And Ryan had asked at an earlier point in the episode, you're inviting Jim? She says, yeah, he's one of my closest friends, of course. Ryan just gives this sort of look and uh, pushes the the invitation to the side. And here... Jim is saying, no, I'm not going to go to your wedding, Pam. The stack of wedding invitations is sitting on receptionist desk and he's leaving. He says, you want me to get those on my way out? And she says, no, I'll take care of them. Maybe to remove his invitation since he's planning on not going. I don't know. But uh, she's crestfallen and it's, it's a sad moment, but I think she understands why. And also in this episode, I think maybe towards the beginning of the episode, Jim and Pam are having their first real conversation in several episodes. I'm looking back. Before this was Valentine's Day, before that was Boys and Girls and the carpet. I don't think they've had a real conversation in several episodes. And at the beginning of the episode, they're talking about something. I'm blanking on what. And Phyllis comes up and interrupts and saying, Pam, I I heard you got your wedding dress. And Jim gets uncomfortable and leaves the conversation and goes back to his desk. They just, they can't seem to be back on track. They're not as close as they have been in the past. And uh, they're not talking nearly as much. And what they are talking about is just constantly being interrupted with, with wedding preparations. And Jim just can't do it. You're right. It probably is the first real conversation since Booze Cruise, uh, right before yeah. Roy came back and decided on a date. Or maybe the carpet. But even then, no. I mean, things have been sketchy ever since. 
I, I mentioned Kelly being in there helping out with Pam, you know, a few episodes back, she asked, can I be a bridesmaid? She wants to be very hands on. She's very into the idea of weddings. She says that Roy set the perfect date for the wedding being June 10th. And, you know, Pam, I always wanted a June wedding. She asks Ryan, who's sitting right there, when do you see yourself getting married? And he says, you know what? I don't see myself getting married. And she just says, oh, <laughs> and walks off. And she's so <laughs> dejected and sad. I mean, poor Kelly. And Pam says, you know, you should be more sensitive. It's obvious that she likes you. And comments like that just, and he interrupts her and says, I know what I said. <laughs> and so we're really finally getting to a point where Ryan is is turning. We're getting the real Ryan. Yeah, I've talked about before how I typically don't like Ryan very much. But here in these first couple of seasons, he's been pretty likable for the most part. Right. He's he's funny. He's smart. But yeah, we're, we're starting to get the uh, the true Ryan colors here. He's... Not a team player, uh, which we have seen in the past. He's he's not about the office. He does not want to be a guy here. He, he knows he's hurting Kelly, but he doesn't like her, so that's fine to him. You're right. This is where he starts to turn, I think. The last character moment I have to mention is Angela, who, as Dwight is leaving for his speech, she stands up and she announces a very impersonal good luck. Good luck to you, Dwight, <laughs> as he's leaving. <laughs> And the, the camera pans over to Pam, and she just sort of eye rolls at the camera like, come on, enough of this. I know. I guess nobody else does. And uh, then she, a little bit later, fakes sickness so that she can sneak out and go watch Dwight's speech. So they're, they're still keeping their relationship in secret, but uh, they're they're showing compassion for each other in their own way. <laughs> they are awfully committed to each other because... I believe in the last episode, Dwight gives her a key, presumably to his place. Uh, Angela, who Kevin, I think, says has never, ever seen call out sick, is leaving sick. Except she's not sick. They are fairly committed for a couple that people does not know exists. They're definitely trying to keep it not public. I don't know their whole reasoning for that. Uh, maybe it's just because it is an office relationship, but... I don't see why that would necessarily hold them back. I, I don't know what their what their holdup is, but they are committed to each other. So who knows? As for funny moments in this episode, we've got the cold open at first where Michael and Dwight are throwing a football back and forth. And they're, it's almost like they're trying to do business talk, like the, the hot potato uh, discussion game, you know, where if you hold the ball, you get to say something. Yeah. But it's just Michael and Dwight participating. And... It's going fine, even though their conversation is stupid. And then Michael accidentally knocks over some stuff on Jim's desk. Jim just says, can we not? And Michael says, we, we have to. I, I don't like being cooped up in my office in that box. I have to be out here. And then uh, Michael throws it really hard at Kevin and he catches it, but papers go flying everywhere. And then he throws it over to Oscar. He tries to and Jim intercepts it. And it becomes a game of keep away from Michael. And he does not like that very much. <laughs> when the, the ball gets to Ryan, Dwight tackles him. And then he pushes over Creed and he pushes over Stanley, which I, I would have liked to have seen the aftermath of that, though we don't get to. Um, then yeah. he hikes it to Michael and Michael realizes it's gone too far. He, he sort of looks apologetic, uh, like, man, I can't believe Dwight did that. He asks Ryan, only Ryan, if he's okay. And for a second, we think he's learned his lesson, but then he shouts Pam's name and moves to throw it at her before the, we, we cut to the theme song. It's just this really silly sequence of events. You would never, I don't think, see that in an office. I mean, there are rules. HR is there for a reason. You can't push people <laughs> like it's, you know, yeah, you can have fun, but there's there are boundaries. And uh, I don't think you see too much contact football in a normal office. <laughs> <laughs> no. And considering what we see Stanley do in how we see him react in the next episode, which we'll talk about. I would have liked, or maybe not liked, to have seen how he'd respond to <laughs> Dwight pushing him down like that because it's deliberate and it's completely backwards. Uh, and Stanley's not even doing anything. He's just walking back to his desk from the copy machine and Dwight pushes him over. Then uh, there's an ongoing sort of joke in this episode with the thermostat. The first mention we get of it, Angela is going over to the thermostat and she adjusts it, makes it a little bit warmer in the office. And Oscar stands up and he sort of glances over. And then we get this talking head and he says, I get to work early so that I can set the thermostat because I like it a little cooler. I like it around 66 degrees. And, you know, some people may not like it as cold as I do, 
but I don't care. <laughs> he just sort of laughs it off. I don't care. I'm <laughs> I'm here first. I get to set it. But then at different points throughout the episode, Kevin goes up and he discreetly visits the water cooler and adjusts the thermostat while filling up his water cup. And he says in a talking head immediately after and says, I always set it to 69. And he gives a stupid Kevin grin. <laughs> and then later, uh, Creed even adjusts the thermostat a little bit. It, it's It's like a weird game of who can control the thermostat for longest contrary to what i just said about the football is probably something that happens in a lot of offices <laughs> <laughs> the uh the power play of the thermostat and lastly for me creed apparently speaks mandarin <laughs> quite well <laughs> jim is asking people for suggestions on places to go because he knows he wants to go on a trip get away from the office get away from the wedding uh, but he doesn't know where and so toby says Amster amsterdam because he went there after his uh, divorce for a week or maybe a month <laughs> he can't quite remember <laughs> no he can't uh i don't know if that's insinuating something that's associated with amsterdam i, I don't know yeah well maybe well, I, yeah <laughs> i feel <laughs> like it is <laughs> and then uh creed speaks up and says you do not want to go to amsterdam trust me jim says okay where where should i go where would you send me creed and he says i would take you to hong kong and then he goes to a talking head and says, this is for my Chinese friends. And I looked it up. Apparently he says, he says it, but it's in a pretty poor accent from what I understand. He says, hello, my Chinese friends. Oh, okay. So there's oh. that. But Creed does speak Mandarin, at least in some capacity. Okay. Well, <laughs> more than me. Yeah, that's true. More Same here. <laughs> now, what about deleted scenes, Katie? Deleted scenes in the moment you were just talking about with Creed where he said he would send jim to hong kong that's in a sort of a faux toastmasters meeting that michael makes the office hold because he says of course as as members of dunder mifflin i of course expect you to be good public speakers as if that has anything to do with their job so there's an extended scene where phyllis is toasting to her good fortune with having found somebody that she's very in love with and that's a nice moment and then ryan toasts to business school and how he hopes to uh after completing business school maybe land a challenging full-time or part-time position somewhere else <laughs> he's just <laughs> toasting to getting out of Dunder Mifflin and finding a new job and Michael right. meets that with this is not about that we are not supposed to be toasting other jobs sit down <laughs> he's he does not want to lose Ryan yeah and he has a talking head right after where he says you know Ryan is a temp and I am scared to death that he could leave at any time. Because <laughs> <laughs> with uh, the contracted workers, the hired workers, they have to give two weeks, right? But Ryan is working through a temp agency and can leave pretty much whenever he wants. It's funny that Ryan prefaces that with, I'm learning a lot here. Like he's trying to appease Michael and not <laughs> say the quite wrong thing. But the fact that he's considering leaving it all to Michael is a wrong thing considering his sort of man crush on Ryan. And then we have an extended Michael speech scene, which we mentioned earlier, but it is amazing how poorly Michael is doing <laughs> during this speech. Uh, just within this snippet in the deleted scenes, he goes from quoting Dana Carvey. Uh, I had to look that one up because the reference wasn't clear, uh, but he quotes Dana Carvey. Then he quotes Bill Cosby and goes on this Bill Cosby thing for a, few, uh, a minute or two. And then he imitates a race car. And then he goes to talking about how it's important to keep a client list. And then a baby starts crying. And so he says, can you shut up your baby, please? Uh, I mean, who brings a baby to a sales conference? Really rude. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so bad. It's, it's really bad. That deleted scene takes place over about two and a half minutes of just probably improv impersonations of, of, like you said, race cars and... Just all these random things that Michael is just thinking of on the spot, and it's all just very painful to watch. And it's a very long deleted scene, which I think they do a lot of in the office. They'll just film Steve Carell doing something and <laughs> stick that deleted scene because it's going to be funny. It makes you wonder for Michael as a character do you think he's actually pretty good at public speaking when he has something prepared and planned? But this is just another instance of him being a bad improviser, contrary to what he might think of himself. Yeah, maybe. But I'm not sure Michael can stick to the rules and stick to what's expected of him closely enough that, I mean, as we've seen, if, if he's expected to bring his sales records to a meeting, he's going to make a Faces of Scranton video. I mean, he just, he can't 
stick to the requirements. I don't know. He's, he's probably a good public speaker if he stuck to what was expected. Yeah, it sort of begs the question, has he changed since he became a manager? Or do you think maybe he's making up his successful speeches from the 90s and that they actually weren't very good, or at least they were only good in his eyes? I don't know. It's just some questions. Does Michael think of himself pretty... Well, yes, he thinks of himself pretty highly. But do you <laughs> think everybody else shared that that thought when he gave his speeches back in the late 90s? Uh, and were they as amazing as he makes them out to be? I think probably he's making it up or that he thinks that they are way better than they were. I believe people can change, but I don't know that you can change that much. <laughs> He's, uh, <laughs> I, I doubt you become a worse public speaker as time goes on. I bet it's only better. I don't know. I, I just can't imagine him, him giving a relevant, coherent speech, especially two years in a row. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I would sort of like to think that if he had a plan and if he had notes, then he would be at least passable. And he might just be exaggerating how passable right. they were. Anyways, to finish up, how about you take us into our discussion topic for this episode? Because the topic of this episode is public speaking. Um, Chad, what is something that scares you to do in public, i.e. public speaking? You know, I'm not all that scared of public speaking. Um, I feel like I'm pretty well spoken. <laughs> I, I would hope so. I have a couple of podcasts. I <laughs> uh, have been doing <laughs> that, that for a few so years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know. I guess embarrassment. Like doing embarrassing things or making a fool of myself in public is something that yeah. I don't like the idea of. And so that could be tied in with public speaking if something happened on stage, I suppose. But really, it's right. just like basically make doing anything that Michael does in public <laughs> sort of scares me. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? I do not dance in public. I do not. Which is funny because I dance, but that's choreographed. Like I do ballet or tap or something, but... If it's like, now we're going to dance in public, like at a wedding or prom yeah. or anything. I, I did not dance at prom. I, I do not dance in public. It's a huge phobia. I hate because I'm just this dorky, skinny little white girl and I <laughs> dance like one. And my hips are fused together. I swear. I just, I can't dance. <laughs> and so anytime... Oh, no. Mm -mm. I'm just sweating thinking about it. I don't. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, I'm not all that fond of it either, but I've got a, a wedding in a couple yeah. of weeks I'll be going to where I know <laughs> I'll have to dance a, a little bit. So oh, I, I hang out by the drinks or the food or I chat with somebody, but I will avoid dancing. I'm pretty sure at my own wedding, I won't be dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Our next episode is episode 18, Take Your Daughter to Work Day. It aired on March 16th of 2006 and was directed by Victor Nelly Jr. and written by Mindy Kaling or Kelly Kapoor. It's Take Your Daughter to Work Day at Dunder Mifflin. Stanley, Toby, and Kevin bring in their daughters, or future daughters in Kevin's case, and Meredith brings in her son. Pam has to remind Michael to keep his humor clean on this day. Pam also thinks she's not very good with kids, so her mission for today is to befriend one kid, just one. Michael shows The Office his childhood appearance on the kids' show Fundle Bundle, and the kids in The Office that day remind him that he hasn't achieved his dreams. In fact, he's not even close. So Michael decides to start online dating. At the end of the day is a pizza party, and Jim leaves early to go on a date to Pam's chagrin. Yeah, this episode was mostly for me a funny moments episode for a lot of it, and in the last, like, ten minutes or so... It got a little bit more serious. It got a little bit more real in a couple of instances. It's funny how Michael sort of goes on this transformation from not liking the idea of kids being at work just because he has to censor himself and be a little bit more clean. He says, it's like I'm Eddie Murphy from Raw and they're trying to make me into Eddie Murphy from Daddy Daycare. <laughs> He's both good movies, but still it's not the same. And he says, who knows what I'm going to say as if he has no control over his words or actions. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes, honestly, I don't think he does. <laughs> he doesn't have much of a filter. It's like the first thought that pops into his head just spills out without any control of, of Michael's. In fact, yeah, Michael says that he would rather be the fun uncle than the dad, which at 25, I can relate to. Yeah, <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, that's a lot of responsibility, but he says he'd rather just be around and be in the kid's life, but he's not sure he wants to be a dad, at least at this point in his life. He, uh, however, hits it off pretty pretty well with Toby's kid, Sasha, which is funny given that he hates Sasha's dad. <laughs> right. 
and the rest of the kids actually get pretty attached to him as well. But they think he's funny, um, probably because he has the sense of humor of a kid a lot of the time. Yeah, <laughs> he does really well with kids. We've seen that for a couple episodes now. He's always really good with kids. Maybe his hesitation was just that they were in his workplace and he's like the the boss man here and is used to being able to do what he wants, but can't dumb it down or doesn't want to dumb it down. I don't know, in his own space. But he's having a good time with the kids. He's getting along with them really well. He says, oh, I was on a kid's show. And Ryan, go go to my mom's house. It's 15 minutes away. Go go get the tape in the basement. Break in if you have to because the kitchen window is always open. Just boost yourself up if you have to. Get the tape, get my guitar, and get a tambourine. And so Ryan goes. He gets it, and he brings back the pizza as well. And so everybody, the whole office, including the kids, are in the conference room eating pizza they watch the video and it ends up being like the most depressing thing <laughs> we've seen regarding Michael so <laughs> far because he is talking to this puppet who asks him what he wants to be or what he wants to do when he grows up. He says, I want to be married so I can have a hundred kids so I can have a hundred friends and nobody can say no to being my friend. And the camera lingers on the puppet's face and the jaw on it just drops. Like, <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. Like, what this kid who brought this kid here? Why Why is he bringing it down? It's just so depressing. It's, it's a small glimpse into why Michael is the way he is. And it really does turn introspective when the kids start asking, well, are you married? No. Do you have at least a girlfriend? No. And he decides to grab a slice of pizza and secludes himself in his office and mope most of the rest of the day it's pretty sad i feel bad for him toby does too and he comes and brings all the toys and his watch and other things that sasha has taken from michael's office and asks him how he's doing michael's resistant at first he says you're only asking that because you're in hr you have to ask me that but next thing we know they're having a conversation and michael's being very honest with toby we get a couple of those in the series but they're very rare so enjoy it because this does not happen too often and he uh yeah, he's open with him. He's treating him like a peer, like an adult. And Toby, I think, is probably really good at his job as well. He uh, gets Michael to open up and approaches him like a friend. And Michael does say, you know, yeah, I'm I'm alone and I don't want to be. And I don't know if it's Toby that convinces Michael to start online dating. But Michael, at that point, does decide to start online dating. And we get his hilarious and super awful username little kid lover which uh, oh that way people will know exactly where my priorities are at <laughs> yeah i'm sure they will michael uh <laughs> not the priority is you're thinking but priorities nonetheless normally with these toby michael scenes we'll have like a, a nice moment but then mike will ruin it by saying something awful to toby but thankfully there's not actually one of those moments here it it ends with michael saying thank you i appreciate it this means a lot that you took the time to talk to me. And then he even asks if Sasha already has a godfather. And she does. But uh, right. <laughs> it says a lot in that moment, I think, that Michael is willing to consider Sasha, the daughter of Toby, his hated HR nemesis. He's willing to be her godfather. I couldn't remember watching this again if there was a weird moment at the end. And I was preparing myself for one. Surely he's going to say something horrible to Toby. But... It was really nice that he didn't, and I think that was maybe the only time that a nice conversation between the two of them did not end badly. We'll yeah, maybe so. And uh, this scene, that scene also reveals that Michael is really keen on having like his own flesh and blood child, because Toby says you could maybe even foster if if you don't want to wait on the whole dating girlfriend wife process, you could foster a kid. And Michael says, or or biologically. <laughs> so he's really keen <laughs> to have his own kid. And then Michael's arc for this episode ends, you know, we have one more thing to do. Don't leave yet. And Dwight grabs his guitar because apparently, well, we knew Michael doesn't play guitar from the, the booze cruise deleted scene where he attempts to play smoke on the water really poorly. Um, but Dwight's playing guitar. Michael and him are singing Teach Your Children by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And it's a really sweet moment. It's a great end to the episode. There, there's this line in the song that talks about uh, they love you. And Dwight even has this really sweet moment. And he says, yes, your parents love you very much. It, it's, it's, it's a nice moment for both Dwight, for Michael, a good way to wrap up the episode. 
It seems to be a bit of an out-of-character nice moment for Dwight, given that the rest of the episode, he has been absolutely horrible with kids. He's been scaring them, reading a terrifying German book about a man that cuts off kids' thumbs if they suck their thumbs, (laughs) which (laughs) Michael says something about Nazis, which leads Sasha to ask, what's a Nazi? And that is not the point of bring your daughter to work day. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) <laughs> it, it, it's almost like a demented Mary Poppins or Mrs. Pig a Wiggle or Nanny McPhee yeah. kind of thing where the person comes in and teaches children manners. But I don't think cutting off thumbs is the way to do that. But apparently in Dwight's Not family, so <laughs> that is the way things go. And in fact, uh, there's even this moment at the very end of the episode where Dwight's talking about how he the, the his family typically considered children to be very valuable. They would have a lot of them so that they could have enough laborers to work the fields. Because he works a beet farm. And when it came to really cold winters and there weren't enough food or grains or vegetables, they would eat the weakest of the brood. And he pauses there and you believe him because it's Dwight. <laughs> and knowing what we know of Dwight so far, it does not seem all that far-fetched uh, that they w- might eat a child to make it through the winter. And then he laughs and he says, oh, don't worry. They didn't eat the children. And he says, it never came to that. Which so you have you you have a moment where you're horrified because they're eating children and he laughs and says oh they didn't eat the children and so you're relieved oh good of course they wouldn't nobody would eat children and he says it never came to that and so then you think wait a second is there a possibility that it could have come to that and they would have like they have that established it's, it's just like a, a roller coaster of emotions for Dwight and children eating it's just not out of the question it's. Something that I guess could happen if it came to it, which, you know what, we we don't know a lot about Dwight's family right now, but fear not, we will learn more, and that's some of my favorite material, is learning about Dwight's family. Agreed. But the whole episode, he is trying to get along with kids, or he's trying to to interact with them in some way. There's this one bit with Abby, who is Kevin's future stepdaughter, there's this bit where, where Jim and Abby shake hands and Jim pretends that Abby is super strong and it's hurt his hand. And Jim says, Dwight, shake her hand. It's ridiculous. She's so strong. And Dwight, of course, does not play along like you're kind of supposed to do with kids, you know, right. play along and make them feel like they're super strong. I mean, it's just part of the game. And Dwight refuses to play along. He's pretty horrible, but he's trying. He is. He tells Meredith's son, Jake, that it's incredibly disrespectful that he calls his mom by her first name. And Jake starts calling him Mr. Poop instead of Mr. Shroot. And then he does the whole reading the cautionary tales from his childhood about the the guy who snips off children's thumbs. And Angela comes up and says, you know, I never disobeyed my father because he was a strict disciplinarian. And I would hope for the same qualities from my mate. And of course, that that gets Dwight going. And so Jake comes up and calls him Mr. Poop again later. And he says, that's not my name. Jake calls him ugly. Dwight says, well, at least I'm not some horrible little latchkey kid who got suspended from school. So, <laughs> and after that, Angela, who just witnessed this, smiles at him. Like, it's a it's a funny thing to be proud of. But she's proud of Dwight that he just, just told off this kid uh, and made him feel bad about himself. Which using Jake as kind of a turning point here. Of all people, Pam befriended Jake, married to the son, which was probably a pretty unlikely pairing, but they bonded over the shredder and Pam succeeded in her goal for the day. She made one kid like her. Yes, and I don't think she expected to like him as well because there was an earlier moment where Roy was actually horsing around with Jake. He says, I love this kid. Jake is a boy. He's not... He shouldn't be there for take your daughter to work day, but he is because he's been suspended from school for a week and Meredith didn't want to pay for a babysitter. So he's a problem kid. He's rude. He calls his mother by his first name. He calls Dwight Mr. Poop. He's not really a good kid, but I mean, he likes shredding paper. And so Pam is technically successful in her her challenge for herself that day. Well, and of course, Pam, it's it's a small scene, but Pam we see smiling over at Jim, and I, I guess it was Abby. She loves watching Jim with kids, which, if that's not a sign of love, I don't know what is. <laughs> when you see the person you're interested in play with kids, if you love kids and you see them get along with kids, it's pretty awesome. 
And we see her looking over at Jim, smiling as he's bonding with this kid. And I just see little heart eye emojis all over the screen. I mean, she is, at that moment, I don't think she realizes that she has feelings for him, but that'll do it. I mean, she sees him as a father, I think, at that point. Jim gets along with the kids really easily, especially Abby. And her and Kevin come over at the end of the day and invite him over for dinner. And he says, oh, I can't because I actually have a date. And behind Kevin, you can see Pam eavesdropping and looking pretty interested. Like, really? He has a date? Who with? Uh, she's she's considering all of that. And then when Michael and Dwight are singing their songs in the their song in the conference room earlier, they're having a conversation about Michael's lack of guitar skills. And she turns away and she's watching the performance. And while she's looking away, Jim sneaks away and grabs his coat and starts to leave for the door. And she she turns to start saying something else, and he's gone. And he just mouths to her, "Hey, I gotta go." And it's for this date. And so Pam just sort of. Her, her smile droops a little bit and she's lost in the moment because there he goes. Yep. And I was wondering if, if you thought that was with Brenda, because that's the last person we've heard Jim talk to that wasn't Pam woman wise about asking on a date. And I, I wonder, I mean, we never see Jim and Brenda together, but who knows? Yeah, it's possible. Um, This is right after he's decided he's going on this trip and uh, he's trying to escape from Pam in the wedding, and so it's probably safe to assume it's Brenda, just because he did call her a couple episodes back uh, during the carpet, I believe. We haven't heard anything since, but it's probably a safe bet that it might be Brenda that he is meeting up with. So I think that ties it up for our character interactions. What funny moments did you have, Chad, for this episode? I like at the beginning of the episode where Michael, he's trying to avoid addressing, like making a statement to the office, welcoming the kids for the take your daughter to work day. And Pam insists, tells him he has to, as the boss, you have to say something. And so he tells him, I'm the boss here. And then he talks to himself and says, how do I put this in words that they can understand? Like, like they don't understand the word boss. (laughs) And so he says, I'm like Superman, and these people are all like the citizens of Gotham City. And Dwight and Jim together say, that's Batman. And Michael says, well, then I'm Aquaman. Where does he live? Jim responds, the ocean. And Michael just sort of drops his head and starts heading into his office. I work with a bunch of nerds. (laughs) I like this bit where I guess it could fall under character interactions, but let's bring it up here. So Stanley's daughter, Melissa, has taken to Ryan. She is talking to him all day and talking and talking. And she's a teenage girl, so she can talk. And she probably has a little crush on Ryan. She asks for his phone number so that they can text. She's teasing him because he doesn't know about this particular coffee chain and says, oh my gosh, I have to take you. Let's let's chat and I'll I'll text you. And Kelly, because she likes Ryan goes up to Stanley and says, you know, take a look at this. I, this seems off. And so Stanley just attacks Ryan verbally and says, don't (laughs) you, you need to get away from my daughter. Don't you dare. This is a little girl. If I ever see you near her again. And Ryan just shrinks. He is terrified of Stanley. And he says, that was one of the more terrifying experiences I've ever had. (laughs) Like it was, we have not seen Stanley like this yet. Boy, have I lost your mind because I'll help you find it. (laughs) One of those great Stanley quotes. He doesn't say a lot often, but those those moments where he he is laying into somebody, uh, they really stand out and he really lays into Ryan here. And it's all because Kelly got jealous of this eighth grader who has a little crush on Ryan. Ryan wasn't doing anything wrong. Not this time. He was just standing there taking the 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 talk you know and yeah uh, yeah you know melissa probably shouldn't be crushing on an adult but she was and of course ryan wasn't gonna do anything but stanley got defensive he got dad mode <laughs> <laughs> and earlier in the episode kelly had said something about how toby's daughter is adorable and she can't wait to get pregnant on her own and have babies and ryan is standing right behind her and he's sort of wide-eyed like I don't want this. And he has this talking head about how he and Kelly agreed to have fun. And he's learning that for Kelly, having fun is getting married and having kids immediately with him. Right now. <laughs> with me. <laughs> and uh, 
there, there's later when uh when when michael and dwight are performing at the end uh kelly and ryan are sitting next to each other and she loops her arm through his and leans up against him and he's not all that happy about that either but he takes it changing subject a little bit a little bit about michael he cannot understand there, he has this talking head where he doesn't understand why parents complain so much about how hard it is to raise kids just give them pizza and candy they're adults <laughs> <laughs> which no no and no you you know if you give a kid candy all the time they're gonna be horrible and they're not adults they're kids he says it himself he negates his own statement but he's not a dad of course and he does not understand how hard it is and maybe one day he will but i don't think he's emotionally prepared right now to have kids <laughs> no he clearly doesn't know everything that goes into it he just gets a glimpse of what's happening at work and how he does seem to attract them and have uh, fun with them, but he's not getting them in an honest setting at all. Lastly, we've got Creed, uh, who, when Michael brings the kids up to him and introduces him, this is Creed. He's in charge of something. Isn't that right? And Creed says, yes, that is right. <laughs> we, we don't know what, uh, but he's in charge of something. And he says, how would you like to see a foot with only four toes? And Michael says, no, no, what is wrong with you? And Creed says, what? The, the hair covers it mostly. <laughs> I almost feel like I have to mention every time Creed says something in an episode because it's always funny. It's so rare, but every time it's just a huge visual for us as to what he is like because they're always very interesting bits. Now, as for deleted scenes, what what did you write down? We learned that Jim has babysat for Toby's daughter, Sasha. He says, you know, yeah, Sasha's cool, but I don't know if she thinks I'm very cool because she's seen me play with dolls, which <laughs> that's that's kind of sweet. So we know Jim likes kids. We know he babysits some, maybe on the weekends. It makes sense because uh, Jim had mentioned earlier that him and Toby used to sit next to each other. So they're actually decent friends from what we understand. Right. We don't see a whole lot of that, but I guess more in the deleted scenes. There's a whole storyline that happens in the deleted scenes that we don't really get in the main episodes. So if you get a chance and you haven't watched the latest scenes, they're really worth watching. Not you, Chad, obviously, because you right. watch them. <laughs> <laughs> One of the deleted scenes is actually the return of the party planning committee, which we don't get in the main episode, but they're making a list of supplies for the party, the pizza party that day and ordering the pizza. And Angela makes, or is wanting to make the most boring pizza order of all time, where she says five plain and one veggie. Phyllis suggests pepperoni. Angela says no. Ryan asks for extra cheese. Angela says absolutely not. And Pam says, hey, I like extra cheese too. Angela just stares for a moment and says, fine. The first lesson we'll teach children will be about obesity. <laughs> <laughs> and if I remember the actual episode, I think there were more toppings than just cheese and extra cheese. I think there was some, there was beef or pepperoni or something. I don't know. So maybe she changed her mind a little bit more or maybe I'm just misremembering. But none of those seem really crazy. Angela is not the most uh, adventurous woman, and I guess not with her pizza toppings either. Apparently not. But, you know, she also, back in email surveillance, she revealed that she's vegetarian because she goes to Jim's barbecue and is amazed that he doesn't have vegetarian options at a barbecue. Um, so it makes sense right. that she would just want to order cheese pizza and veggie pizza. But that's not at all the popular option when it comes to ordering pizza for a group of people. I thought one of the uh, more interesting deleted scenes of, of the ones provided were um, Roy and Daryl were up in the break room and they were joking around with Jake, Meredith's son. And Daryl kind of playfully grabs Jake on the shoulder. And um, Michael freaks out and angrily intervenes and says, do not touch him. And in a talking head interview, Michael admits that he didn't do background checks on the warehouse crew. So he did it on the office staff, but not on the warehouse crew. I guess making sure no one was, I don't know, a pedophile? Like, it, it was weird. He uh, He wanted to make sure that the warehouse crew not touch the kids because he didn't know their histories. It was very odd. It was very out of place. I am glad that this was cut just because it seem, it doesn't seem completely out of character for Michael because on one hand, he sees Daryl touching Jake. And so it might be another one of Michael's racist moments where he thinks that because Daryl is black, he's about to do something uh, to Jake. I, I don't know for sure. Uh, and yeah, it was he, weird. So, so he does, he's, he admits to not doing background checks on the warehouse guys. And so 
first off, there's no reason for him to be concerned over this particular matter. But the fact that he didn't do background checks is a pretty big deal. Like that, that is a problem. And uh, yeah, it, it it's just concerning to know that uh, they sort of just hire willy nilly in the warehouse. I don't know. We also have one. Um, one of the other ones I wanted to mention was Melissa, who is Stanley's daughter, is using Oscar's computer. And Oscar comes back and says, hey, I was actually in the middle of something, if you wouldn't mind. And Melissa says, you know, just give me one second. I'm almost done. And Oscar says, no, no, I, I really need to get back to work, if you wouldn't mind. And she says, dude, chill. I'm almost done. And refuses to get up. And Oscar just kind of stands there. <laughs> Goodness. I, I can't imagine Stanley raising such a bratty kid, but sheesh. Oscar then leaves and calls Stanley's name like he's about to go get him to intervene. And there was an <laughs> yeah. earlier deleted scene as well when Stanley was telling Melissa to put her phone or iPod down and learn. And she says, what am I going to learn here? <laughs> he responds, why daddy's so cranky when he gets home from work every day? <laughs> <laughs> and then he has this short talking head about how she's spoiled and how all she does is play on her phone and spend his money at that Steamtown mall. I don't know. He he thinks she's spoiled. And so I guess that's evidence of her being spoiled is her feeling entitled to using Oscar's computer when he asks her to move. Then an, a sadder moment for Pam. Abby comes up to her desk for candy. And it's not the first time she's come up for candy or the first time that Pam has tried to uh, win her over. But this time, Abby sees a drawing that Pam has been working on on her little sketch pad. And she says, oh, do you draw? Did you draw that? And Pam says, yeah. Do you like to draw? And she says, yeah, I want to I want to be an artist when I grow up. And Pam says, me too. And Abby responds, you're already grown up. And Pam just sort of sits oh. there like, wow, you're right. That sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> I am a grown up. Like, I don't know about you, Chad, but I still have that feeling of like, oh, you know, what would be cool when I grow up. Oh, wait, I'm 25. Like, <laughs> right. Um, Pretty, mu pretty much there. It's, yeah. We're students for so long. We go through elementary school, secondary school, college, and w the whole time we sort of think of ourselves as young and not children necessarily, but not necessarily full-fledged adults either. And then all of a sudden we're in the adult world and we still like to think of ourselves as younger and a lot of life ahead of us. And hopefully, God willing, we do have a lot of life ahead of us, but a lot of life has gone by too. And that's what Pam is realizing there in yeah. the moment is that, She's lost a lot of time, and here she is, a receptionist in a paper company, not an artist like she wanted to be when she grew up. Lastly, Jim gives Abby a certificate of appreciation that was signed by Michael, and Dwight responds, hate to break it to you, Abby, but it's a fake. It doesn't have a certification number, so it is obviously a fake. Sorry to disappoint you. And Jim says, actually, there is a certification number. Uh, and he points to the corner, and sure enough, there's a series of numbers and letters there. And Dwight says, oh, well, well done. <laughs> and Jim has his talking <laughs> head about how it's just a bunch of random numbers and how you have to do what you have to do, which means that he anticipated Dwight having that exact argument ready <laughs> and was prepared and had an answer to that argument. <laughs> I don't know if that's a testament to how long they've been working together or just Jim understanding the way Dwight thinks or what, but uh, he was prepared and he had that certification number, fake or not. So Chad, I think you had our discussion topic for this week. What do you have? I did, and it's inspired by Michael's inability to play guitar despite owning one and asking Ryan to grab it and bring it to the office. So I was wondering, do you have any instruments or just any other item or something that requires a skill or a specific knowledge that you don't have? Yes. And I'm about to make that mistake again, actually. So I have a guitar, which I guess it's the same as Michael, but I am slowly learning. Um, I'm very bad, and I can only play a few chords, but I'm learning. It's one of those things, though, that, you know, they're relatively inexpensive, and I feel like it's something that I'm going to keep learning. So I don't feel too, too guilty having one uh, and not knowing how to play it. But what I am about to do, I think, is buy a DSLR camera which I know nothing about photography <laughs> at all. <laughs> but I really want one and I really want to learn about photography. So that's going to be my, my next mistake. What about you? Well, best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> I also have a couple of guitars. I have an acoustic one and I have an electric one that I rarely touch. I did pick up the acoustic one a couple... Well, I picked up both of them a couple weeks ago. And I'm probably in, around the same boat as you where I know a few chords. I have spent a lot of time in the past trying to learn it. 
where I, I had like an instructional book, like essential elements or something. And I worked all the way through it. And so I got the basic skills down pretty well, but then not touching it for a long time. I lost the, the finger strength for pressing down on the strings. And I just forgot a lot of the chords and I've got a clarinet as well. That's sort of on the same uh, level where I, I know the, the mm. gist of it. I can make a sound on it. I know basic fingerings and notes and all that kind of stuff, but I'm nowhere near proficient on either of those. And then uh, also I, I like to solve Rubik's cubes and puzzles like that in my spare time. And I have a whole bunch that I've collected and sort of the same sort of thing where I've, I've got several that I know how to solve, or I have known how to solve them in the past, but then not touching them or playing with them or uh, taking the time to learn them better over time. I've forgotten or just am slow. So yeah, they're, those are them for me, I suppose. But you know, I feel like it's good to have those things around because it gives you the reminder and the opportunity to learn something new, right? So if I didn't have my guitar, I'd never learn how to play it. So right. Yeah. Better to have it around, I say. Yeah, it's it's good to have something even to just pick up every once in a blue moon. Uh, if you're bored or if you need something to calm you down, that something tactile like that can really calm your mind and give you something non-work related or non this related or that related to focus on so you're not focusing on something that stresses you out so well i think that wraps up our official 12th episode of an american workplace you can contact us on facebook at facebook.com slash workplace pod or at workplace pod on twitter please remember to rate review and subscribe on itunes and if you have feedback or ideas you can do that at workplace pod at gmail.com you can find me on twitter at kt lady 623 or on facebook.com slash katie.white. And the best place to find me is also on Twitter at chadadada, that is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A, and facebook.com slash chad.hopkins, and my other podcast, Cinescope, where I talk about the movies I love and why we love them. And you can find that at our website, thecinescopepodcast.com. All of our show notes and all of our contact information can be found at our website, workplacepodcast.com. That's all for this week. Thank you all so much for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 12 of An American Workplace. Be sure to join us in episode 13 for a discussion on the next two episodes of season two, Michael's birthday and drug testing. Thanks so much. Bye. See ya. See ya.